The Laughing Cavalier here, presenting to you another tale of these troubled times with some 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 angry notes <laughs> for, for an unscripted video. So before I get on to the main topic of this, I'm just going to go over um, a little bit of what I've got planned in the future because um, I'm slowly working my way through Tudor Rant 4. That's, I've got all the audio recorded now. I'm just trying to edit all the footage that's taken a while. Um, but I'll pop up on screen just my plan in my head so far of how I'm going to progress with the Tudor Rant series once part four is done. Because, I mean, obviously we've got um, season two of The Spanish Princess coming up later this year. Uh, I will do a rant about the White Queen in between part four and five, but I'm going to call it a medieval rant. I think it fits better in that sort of time period. Um, then they're going to go back to the Tudors, but I think I'll do one per season of that. Um, and then in between I'll do other other ones. Um, and so far I've got a plan to work out to about part 13, so I'm I'm basically set for the next... <laughs> few years and they'll, they'll probably be making some more terrible ones in the meantime and speaking of terrible ones i today decided to rewatch one of them um the other berlin girl um because basically i should also say um the uh back when i got a thousand subscribers i was going to do a thousand subscribers special but then it kind of got bigger <laughs> what i was going to do and now basically what the plan is for that is i'm going to do a special video look doing a rough overview of all tudor dramas so um, that's going to be a passion project and take me years, I'm afraid. But to do that, I've been going over rewatching just a few few dramas. There's one I hadn't seen for a while, and that's The Other Berlin Girl, the 2008 adaptation. Um, and I uh, just early today watched it. And I mean, obviously, it's a Philip Gregory drama, so I wasn't expecting much. But I, I didn't remember it being too bad. But uh, oh boy, it was <laughs> it was pretty dire. I mean, I uh, I made several pages of notes here, so I've got enough stuff for when uh, whenever we do a rant video on it. But I mean, just starting off, it's just like, what the hell is the timeline of this video, of um, this film? It's like, I mean, it's also, it's a, one of the main premises of the thing is they have Anne Boleyn being the older sister as opposed to Mary, which is like, no, it's, it's pretty much universally accepted by historians that Anne was the younger sister. That's, that's, that's been the thing for a while. Why? Why did you make Anne the older one? Uh, they, I think they start about 1520, because that's when Mary got married, but they miss out all the them going to France, because Mary had been in France and may have had an affair with the king with the king of France, Francis II. Um, he par- apparently said some some things about her. They just don't mention this. In fact, they make her out she's this really pure, innocent person, which is like, um, really? <laughs> um, and then, again, Anne has not been to France, but then they make out it's... I'm just baffled at what they've done. It's, they, they make out that Thomas Boleyn and uh, Thomas Howard, the Duke of Norfolk, want... And to marry Henry in 1520, because uh, Catherine of Aragon by this point can't have any more children. Which is, okay, that's really early. Um, so the king is, is on a visit, and they, they present Anne. But then he falls in love with Mary, so they decide to... It's like, oh yeah, Mary can hook up with Henry, even though she's Mary's already married. <laughs> Just like, how are you going to get round of that in your, your devious plan there? It's like, <laughs> I don't understand that. Uh, then the whole thing happens with uh, Northumberland and, and Anne, even though in this one they actually get married. And it's like, oh, for... Mm. By the way, actually, can I just mention as well, historically, Anne was probably going to marry the Marcus of Ormond, which is one reason why they didn't want the Northumberland match to happen. Um, I think it was Marcus of Ormond or Earl of Ormond, one of the two. That's never mentioned at all. And the fact that after they send her off to France as punishment, and it's like, what? She, she'd she been in France for years at the court. Why did you... Why? why? <laughs> Sorry, you're going to hear a lot of these angry sounds throughout. And then I, I don't get this silly place. So she goes to France for a couple of months, but then she comes back a different person, lands on a beach, by the way. I was like, oh, God, I'm having Spanish princess flashbacks. It's like, there's a thing called dockyard. Go go to a dockyard if you're going to come off a ship. Please. Anyway, irrelevant. <laughs> and then she's completely different, and she's, oh, she's been changed by her experience in France. And then and then she then Henry falls in love with Anne, and then, then Norfolk gets really angry. like, oh, you're ruining the plan now. It's like, but your original plan was for he- Anne to hook up with Henry. I just, oh. <laughs> what is this? I, it's just so weird. And this is the first, like, sort of hour or so of the film. And then, you know, then Catherine Marigan. And then she's made queen. And then they just rush the last half hour. It just whizzes through. Elizabeth is born. Um, then Henry's kind of gone off her. Then... Uh, uh, miscarriage, uh, then that stupid incest. It's like, seriously, Philip and Gregory, what is your obsession with incest? It's like, do you, do you just think you find the most over the top rumours and s- slander about people and just adapt it as truth? Ah, uh, yeah, and then she's ex- arrested really hurriedly and executed. Like, oh, God, it gives you a headache. <laughs> it really does. And then it's, you, you, I don't just I stand at how many much they miss out, particularly with um, important people like Woolsey, Cromwell, and Cranmer, all these really famous ministers of Henry VIII are not there. 
Woolsey is mentioned once, and I think he's in the background of like one scene. Cromwell gets one line, basically just reading out the charges against Anne at her trial. I mean, if, if, if you got your history from this, you wouldn't even know who Cromwell was. You think he's just some lawyer or something randomly there. And, and, the Cron- and Cranmer's nowhere to be seen. And I mean, like the Reformation just happens instantly. It's like, it's just like, oh no, I can't annul my marriage to Catherine. Like, oh, you should like, you know, get rid of the Pope, you know, have your own church. Next scene, Anne, I've got rid of the church for you. It's like, fuck <laughs> I thought the 1972 film rushed it. At least they had a scene where Cromwell and Cranmer have a chat about it and have what they're going to do. Mm. And then uh, there's something else I've, I've been pointing out. She's around four. There's I got a whole rant about it with the um, the dialogue because um, the 2003 Henry VIII series, which I'm doing for around four, had the same writer. I forget his name off the top of my head for, as this film, uh, the other Berlin girl. And you can tell a lot. He ripped a lot of the dialogue from the 1970 series. I can tell a like, particular lot of scenes. Like um, Anne when she has a miscarriage, for example, it's almost word for word the same in the 2003 version. And it's again here. It's like half of the... Because I understand a lot of stuff was taken from the 2003 version. It's like, God, it's so unoriginal. You just And it's, it's not like it's historical dialogue. This is something that was for that drama. And they're the same here. Um, you know, say so like, you know, there can be no blame for that. It's, it's exactly the same. So, I mean, as you can probably guess, my thoughts on the film are not very good. Actually, I don't think it was very good either, to be honest. I mean, I, I I feel really sorry for criticizing Ray Winston in in the um, Tudor Round Four. Now I might have had a disclaimer actually, because <laughs> like at least Ray Winston was trying. At least he had emotion. Eric Banner is really bland as Henry. He's nothing. He gets angry in a couple of scenes, and it's like I get no sense of you know his the artistic side of him, the sort of powerful uh, warrior side of him, um, the soft side of him. You know the angry side. Nothing. It's just well, again, apart from you know that scene where he, he rapes and again taken from the 2003 one, <laughs> uh, which apparently isn't in the book. So like, God. And then obviously I found again some people said to me it's like it's amazing how there's quite a few famous actors in this who were like at the time were were about to become really famous, but uh, like uh, Eddie Redmayne, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, a few others, and just uh, Mark Rylance isn't it? It's Thomas Boleyn. Uh, apart from uh, Mark Rylance, like most of them just have bit parts, and they do, they barely do anything. And it's such a waste of talent. I'm just like, oh, what the hell? And again, I know this is this is getting really nitpicky, but what was that with the bloody yellow filter in this? Like, it's like a, it's like somebody pissed on the camera. It's all yellow. <laughs> Half the film is yellow. It's either that or it's bluey grey. It's like, what happened? It's like, did you put sunglasses on or something? <laughs> It just like oh, and authenticity not fantastic. Some of the, again, I point this out the two thousand three one. Um, a lot of the extras have like fairly accurate costumes, probably because they just reuse them from other things. But the ones they designed for the actual actors are just a bit all over the place. Like particularly the French hoods are all that they look like headbands, which is not how they were. But that's, uh, to be fair, that is a common mistake a lot of Tudor dramas make. But it's like oh dear, and dialogue was just and things just like. There was a bit about a saddle, like when they were um, Anne about to go off riding with Henry Hunting, and there's this like, oh, what, you're riding with us? It's like, oh yes, we've invented a new saddle, even though side saddles existed for hundreds of years. It's like, what is this? And then a lot of sub, I mean, just continue with the inaccuracies. I mean, the execution scene, for example, they have Anne just having you know crying. I mean, they, they were doing like kind of all right. Like they, the word she speaks is actually broadly accurate. And I was like, oh my god, thank for, thank thank God, there's like a decently accurate scene at last, and then. No, then they have her crying and weeping. There's like, oh, she she was a lot of accounts. She was quite brave at her execution, but no, no, we got to you know make her cry. Um, not even feeling sympathy because Anne is made so unlikable in this. It's ter- she's a villain, and then it's like, oh, you got to feel sympathy for her at the end. No, I don't. <laughs> not this version of Anne you've given me. Uh, <laughs> and then after the execution, there's just like the shot of her headless corpse on the scaffold, and the camera slowly pans out. I'm just sitting there wondering like. Why is nobody doing anything? Like they're all just standing around. Like, what, what, are you having a séance? So you're like, you're gonna bury her? Just like, you know, it holds on it for like twenty seconds, like ten seconds. Just like, move, do something. Oh dear. So yeah, I'm in nitpicking mood. <laughs> but you know, it's not all bad because like, when I was um, looking for this, I found this hilarious article from the BBC because again, this is made partly by uh, another one of these cases of too many cooks spoils the, the meal. <laughs> what was it? it was um, uh, where's my notes? Who made it? It was uh, Universal with Columbia Pictures and the BBC. It's like, oh my god, it's like the Hobbit films, you know, with MGM, New Line, <laughs> Warner Brothers. It's like so many. But anyway, the BBC wrote an art a review of this this thing, and of course they gave it four stars out of five. Why wouldn't the BBC review their own film? <laughs> um, so here's the review by Paul Arendt, I think it's pronounced from 2008. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what's going to come. <laughs> Ravishing frocks. 
and heaving bosoms are the main constituents of the other Berlin girl. Now, because the funny, I know I know constituent means like a constituent part, you know, other thing. But the funny thing, like in the UK, you ha- have constituencies, you know, which are when members of parliament are elected to, to Westminster and they're called a constituency. So I just, I'm just thinking of like, you know, it's like, oh, an MP sitting there going, like, I've got to go and see my constituents. Oh, look, here's two of them now. <laughs> Uh, so they are the main constituents of the other Berlin girl, an entertaining bodice ripper, lightly disguised as historical fiction. You know, in the same sense that Superman is sort of lightly disguised, and as like puts the glass on, like, my God, I can't, yeah, I don't know who Superman is. <laughs> but no, it, it's, it's, I wouldn't say historical fiction, just, this is just fiction. <laughs> the frocks and bosoms in question belong to Anne and Mary Berlin, Natalie Portman, Scarlett Johansson, bitter rivals for the affection of Eric Banner's brooding Henry VIII. <laughs> That's another thing as well, um, while I'm on the topic, like the, oh, given that they did try and speak with an English accent in this, um, I, I don't know, they were, they were whispering a lot at the time, I was, I was struggling to hear them, but, um, so I don't know, maybe they were trying to be a bit quieter so they didn't break out to their American accents, but, although I swear there was an, inter- I vaguely remember at the time the film came out, that, um, Eric Banner went and I think it was either Conan O'Brien or Jay Leno, because uh, this is before they, they had that, you know, the whole, <laughs> the whole drama with the late night shows, um, and he said something about the accents and stuff, I'm going to have to go find that. Uh, but yeah, anyway, sorry. Um, essentially, it's the Tudors with the Hollywood budget, a pitched battle between lush romanticism and vicious politicking, even though there's barely any politics in this. They, it's it's literally just the love. There's there's no sense of the Reformation. I mean, literally, there's like just like a line at the end of the film, like, oh yeah, the English Reformation was this really important event. It's like, no shit, Sherlock. It's like it's a bit like if I did a film about like Churchill and Clementine, but I just miss out World War Two and the end of it to say, oh yeah, by the way, World War Two was like this really important conflict, lol. <laughs> Peter Morgan's screenplay, based on a florid novel by Philippa Gregory, portrays the Tudor court as an ermine-lined hotbed of flirting. Henry responded in his infall- <laughs> inflatable shoulder pads. <laughs> I will say, that, to be fair, it's like they did have some sort of baggy costumes a bit, and it's like, <laughs> they're not inflatable. Is a velvet-voiced seducer-in-chief. No, he's not. <laughs> The king and his court has spent so much time bed hopping. It's a wonder they have time to run the country. No, they d- Henry's about the only person who has affairs in this. Gonna, if I'm honest, like, there's, there's barely any other sense of the other. Uh, maybe George Boleyn, um, if you count him, kind of failing to have incest with Anne Boleyn. It's like apparently, like in the books, they literally do have like affair, <laughs> a proper affair, but it's like they tone it down heavily in the film. Um, Johansson's wet Mary pimped out to Henry by her horribly ambitious father. It, oh God! It's like, again, it's like the idea as well that it's sort of um, you know Norfolk and Thomas Boleyn right from the word go are plotting. It's like probably not. It's more than likely it was Henry fell in love with Anne, and then you know Peter Thomas was like, aha, here's an opportunity. Not you know they're literally the, you know the dark power behind the throne arranging it the whole time. She really loves him, unlike her manipulative sis, portrayed by Portman as the ultimate cod beastie. <laughs> I love that they're going in full in on the language here. It's well known that Henry split with the Catholic Church in order to marry Anne, but the, in this version he does it purely to get her heavily embroiled. <laughs> but in this version he does it purely to get into her heavily embroidered pants. Oh, right. And that is the thing that we barely get much stuff on him having needing to have a son and heir. It's like it's, it, it feels like it's just not emphasized. It's like that, that is his main driving force is have a son and heir. And then this is look at this a chocolate truffle of a movie. Director Justin Chadwick shoots in the ravishing style of an M&S commercial, <laughs> lingering delightfully on food and flesh alike, while the soundtrack lays on the heavy, portentous chords as a reminder that, hey, someone's going to get the head shot off eventually. <laughs> oh, God, what just matters is, like, you know, Anne Boleyn's execution is like, Anne Boleyn, you are sentenced to death, um, and you will now be beheaded. But before that, this sword is not any sort of sword. It's an M&S sword. You can buy it for half price in the sale. Okay. <laughs> That's how it goes, yeah. M&S. <laughs> and the soundtrack is like, it feels so odd. Like, remember that there's a scene when um, Henry first sleeps with Mary, and it's, it's all sort of whimsical romantic, and it's like, you know he's like sort of forced her to do this right? This doesn't feel very romantic to me. This is... <laughs> but anyway... It might sound tacky, but in truth, the other Berlin girl is shamelessly good fun. A chocolate truffle of a movie designed to appeal to the overseas heritage cinema market. I've, but they mean America, I think. It was like, if I was an American, and let's assume I just knew nothing about Chief Brunigan, I'd be baffled by this film. I don't know what the frick was going on half the time. It's so, it's so fast, yet so slow. I don't know how it does that. Morgan's adaptation strikes a perfect balance between seriousness and melodrama. 
and Portman really throws herself into the complex character of Anne. I no, she doesn't. I don't think she does. I she's just evil through most of it and kind of vindictive. And then they try and sort of get us some sympathy at the end, but it just it doesn't work. It's like I mean, you can have Anne. You know, the thing with like other portrayals of Anne is like. Lee try and be consistent. They could have Anne of the Thousand Days where uh, Genevieve um, Brijold is a bit more sort of sympathetic, but it's consistent. You know, she does she does things wrong. Um, and even you know uh, has um, Thomas More, you know, Henry to have Thomas More executed, but it's consistent. Wolf Hall they make Anne a bit more negatively, but they're relatively consistent. And then actually it does kind of work. They build it up, you know, make her a bit more sympathetic towards the end. Uh, this is just all, oh. Again, I got my point this actually around four with um, 2003 because again it's similar writing again. Whew, so yeah, um, so it'll be a long time before you get this one as a proper Tudor rant. Um, either either it'll be in the form of the the special video or I'll it'll be like Tudor rant seven or eight, I think whatever I've got on the on the list. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'm working hard on Tudor rant four. I'm I'm hoping to have it done soon. Tm. <laughs> okay, well, I won't make any promises. Anyway, so this has been the Laughing Cavalier. Wishing you a good day.